Welcome to Submarine Live. Uh, we're here at Sonodyne HQ, the amazing engineering company that makes a lot of this submersible exploration possible. And during this week of Submarine Live, as part of AXA XL Oceans Education, we're exploring the science and life of submersible exploration. Now, we've just had an amazing Q&A with Necton, Chief Executive Oliver Steeds, who's on board the Ocean Cephar, and they're exploring the uncharted depths around the Seychelles archipelago in the Indian Ocean. This session is a live investigation, and we're looking at some of the engineering, some of the physics that goes into exploring the depths. Now, the Necton First Descent mission is a series of first descents. And what that means is that scientists, and I'm just going to grab a little submarine down here that I have. Oh, here we go. That scientists are going down in um, human uh, operated vehicles, going down in the pressure holes you may have seen and getting beneath the depths that scuba divers have been operating at. Now the ocean goes from naught meters, the surface, all the way down to 11,000 meters, the very depths down in the Challenger Deep and the Marianas Trench. But just to scratch the surface, just to discover that little bit more, we can look at going from zero to 30 meters. And that is where scuba divers operate. So if you've ever seen those amazing films of scuba divers exploring the reefs or exploring other parts of the underwater world, they're really not getting below 30 meters. So if you want to know what's below 30 meters, you need to think about using different technologies. And that's where submersibles, remotely operated vehicles, and other tools come in. Today we're looking at submersibles and how do you use that. The amazing thing about the Triton submersibles that the Necton team are using is this, not, you've got a sort of a, a pressure hull really at the front with a camera, but imagine that was a sphere, so you've got this pilot and the, and the scientist inside the submersible having these amazing views. Now that enables them to look at the ocean between 30 meters and 300 meters down. And that's really increasing tenfold our ability to get into the depths of the ocean. Now, we spoke to Oliver just earlier, and he was saying, while they haven't been able to say for sure whether they've found any new species on these first descents, that on their last expedition, on a relatively well sampled part of the ocean around Bermuda, they found over a hundred new species, a hundred species previously unknown to science. But we are looking at what are the physics of going from the surface all the way down to the depths. So I'm just gonna move our little submersible back to where it was on the floor, and we're gonna get ready to do a live investigation together. Maybe before I do that, I'll just explain some of the bits and pieces that we have here and really sort of explain really sort of what we'd find on a real submersible. So of course you've got to be able to see out and we've got the camera at the front. We've spoken about having um, that being a sort of whole pressure hull uh, on a real submersible so the scientists can see out. They've got some little contraptions at the front. Maybe that's a camera to see the deep ocean or a grabber or something like that. Now, uh, we've got some thrusters on here because of course you've got to be able to move around. So forwards and backwards, I'm just gonna turn this around here, forwards and backwards, we've got these sort of thrusters or basically look like propellers at the back. You can see that. And then if I lift this up, and I'm just gonna turn this over here, you can see the thruster at the top and that's for sort of moving up and down but that's not really going to get you up and down in the way that you want to. 
So we've got a couple more things that you'd find on an actual submersible. You'd have your battery um, at the bottom because it's all electric powered. And then you'd have ballast tanks. Now ballast tanks are where you have either air or water. Now in your class, and I'm gonna get you up on the live chat here, you will also be able to think about whether air and water is more, which one is more or less dense. So just seeing as we start, what are the schools that we um, have? And we have watching us uh, today from the UK, uh, Canada, uh, Seychelles and Colombia. Welcome all. Um, shout outs go to Worksworth Junior School in Derbyshire. Really excited to be part of this. Well, we're really excited to have you too. Um, we have Door Primary School in Sheffield. We're a long way from the sea, but we're still interested in what happens there. Now, um, just saying uh, to Door Primary and anyone else watching in the UK, that in fact, I think you're never more than 67 miles or something like that from the sea in the UK. So no excuse, maybe this weekend, or maybe as a school trip to get out to the seashore. Um, lots of great questions coming in. And so what we're gonna do, we're gonna do a little live investigation first, and then we'll come on to your questions uh, towards the end of this session. Now, of course, in exploring the deep, the important thing is to be able to go down and then back up again uh, safely. Now going down, incredibly important, otherwise you won't be able to discover what's in the depths of our ocean. But of course, coming back up again, equally important. Now, although the submersibles that the team are using have uh, life support systems for up to 96 hours, that's four full days, we don't want our scientists to be languishing on the bottom of the ocean for that long. So they will need a method to come back to the surface. Now, I will put uh, video ray, our little submarine, um, down here. And we're going to look at what we need for this little submarine engineer investigation. Just unhook myself. I seem to have got tangled up in some leads there. There we go. Now, we need a number of things. And I've just put, I'll just hold this up for the camera. I've just put a uh, drying up cloth on my desk here in case of any spillages. If you are doing this for the first time, I would recommend using a box to put your bottle in or even doing this over a sink because you can get one or two spillages. I'm just going to go through what you all need in your classes to follow along. So, you need a soda bottle or a fizzy drinks bottle. And that, you can see here, make sure all the labels are off, make sure you can see what's happening clearly inside. And if I take the lid off here, you'll see a really important thing for this investigation. You'll see that the water is right up to the top. Okay, so I haven't put the water down here or down here or down here, like you might find it if you got it from a shop, but actually right to the very top of the lip here. And we'll get a little bit of spillage, which is why we have the drying up cloth or using a box or doing this in a sink. So I'm just going to put the top back on here because we don't want that being knocked over or spilled before we do this little uh, investigation. The next thing that everybody will need is a pen top. Okay, so any good plastic pen top will do from a biro or anything else. You'll maybe know that quite a few pen tops that you use in schools have a little hole in the top, just so if you're sucking it, you don't asphyxiate yourself or choke yourself. If that is the case, 
you will need to get a little bit of your blue tack or modeling clay and just squish and make sure that hole is airtight so it's going to look a bit like this. I don't have that problem but if you do have a hole in the top of your pen cap make sure that is sealed up before you start. So we have our bottle full of water, something underneath it or around it in case of any spills, our pen top and some blue tack or modeling clay. So those are the very, very simple things that we need to get together. I'm just going to check to see how you're getting on. I've got the team messaging me in just to make sure you've got all those things set up. Wonderful. So I'm going to take that off because it's going to mess a little bit with the fact that I've just got a normal pen top. This is our submersible or submarine. And what we're going to do is we can see inside it is our ballast tank. And that is now full of air. So if I open up, don't try this yet. I'm just going to show you the first thing. I'm going to put my submersible Hmm. I put my submersible in my ocean and it's just a little bit too floaty. So if we can all get to this stage where we've got our open soda bottle, we've got it full to the brim with water and we've put our submersible pen top in it and it's just a little bit too floaty. I'm going to take my submersible out and I'm going to think like a submarine engineer. So when you're making a real submersible, just imagine that you have that round pressure hull full of air and very, very floaty. Now in a real submersible, they have to put a massive lead weight on the bottom to make sure that it starts to sink. So we're going to, instead of a wet uh, lead weight, we're just going to use a little bit of blue tack, modeling clay, whatever you prefer to call it. I've just put a little bit on the side there. I'm going to see if that increased mass will compensate for the air in here. Let's see if that will start. Hmm. I don't think I put enough extra mass on my submersible to get it to start to be floating in the middle here or floating just beneath the surface. So I'm going to try a little bit more. I wonder how you're getting on and how many little bits of blue tack you're going to need to put on. Now, I would suggest that you do this little by little because if you put too much on in one go, it's going to end up at the bottom of your ocean. And then you'll discover it's quite difficult to get back. And if you had little scientists in there, uh, they would be fairly unhappy with your engineering skills and your ability to get them back to the surface. Put a little bit more, maybe even half that, a pea-sized piece at a time. I'm going to attach that again to the bottom of my submersible, my little pen top submarine. Put that into my ocean there. Okay, so I'm reckoning I'm getting fairly sort of zero marks on my submarine uh, engineering capability, but I'm being safe rather than sorry. I'm going to try another pea sized piece on the side here. And just so I can fit it through, I'm sort of making it in a sort of line down here, so not a massive lump because I know that the neck of the bottle is quite thin. Okay. No. It's 
is rather, rather light. So one more piece. So this is what we're just doing. We're just adding little pieces of blue tack or modeling clay and seeing, and I hope this isn't going to be too much. Otherwise, it's a little bit of trouble. Mm. I wonder how everybody else is getting on. I'll be able to when I'm not covered in sort of slightly slimy blue tack. I'll be able to check in on the live chat to see how you're getting on. Nearly there. I think one more little piece. We might be there. Okay. Make sure that doesn't drop off as we go in. And really what we're seeing here Wowee, this is the most blue tack I've ever had to put on. And of course, I'm going to put that a little bit too much and it's going to sink straight to the bottom and then I'm going to make a huge mess. But one more bit. I'm just a bit rubbish at this. I hope you're doing rather better than I am. Hmm. There we are. And if this doesn't work, so just floating on the top there, yes. OK, so I've got my submersible just floating at the top. And now I am going to close my ocean very tight. Dry my hands and let's talk through what's happening. So what we have here, we've got the pen top which is full of air. To balance out that air, I've attached all of this blue tack to the side. That increased mass, making it so that the entire thing is roughly the same density as the water. Now, I'm at the surface here, but I want to go down. Now, what a real submersible would do at this stage is it would swap inside the pen top, it would push the air out and replace that with water. So because there is less air and more water in there, that changes the density of my submersible and it will start to fall. The way that I'm going to do this with my little submersible in here is by squeezing the sides of the bottle. If I squeeze the sides of the bottle, that's going to force water up into my pen top. Now, because this is live, and because things normally go wrong when this is live, let's see what happens. I'm going to squeeze. And I've forced enough water into my pen top and we can see if I squeeze it really hard see if I can get all the way to the bottom of the ocean Ta -da! and I let go and it comes back up to the top again and what I would really love to so get to a stage in your classes if you're following along live don't worry if you're not so you can always do this um, tomorrow on in the, in the next lesson we're looking at the fact that you need to change the density of the overall submersible for it to sink. So I'm going to force water into the pen top and there we can see a nice controlled dive all the way down to the bottom, find some new species and then gently come up very very slowly, maybe even explore something on the way up and hover there. Well, you do need to squeeze quite hard, and that is also why you need the water bottle really full. So what we can see here is that the way that submersibles and submarines go up and down in the ocean is by changing the amount of air or water 
in what are called ballast tanks, and these are tanks strapped to the side of the submersible. Before it starts, we need to weight the submersible down because the amount of air in the, in the pressure hull. And instead of having a massive lead weight, we've actually used blue tack to attach to the side. And there we go. I'm going to see if I can achieve something called neutral buoyancy, which is where it will hover in the middle. So how much do I have to squeeze? How much do I have to squeeze to get the extra little bit of water in my ballast tank to achieve neutral buoyancy? And I think that's pretty good. How do you think I, I've done, guys? Pretty good? Yeah. Yes. So I'm just going to see on the live chat, and the team in the office will be sending that through to me to find out how you're getting on. Um, and then we'll come to some of those amazing questions uh, that you've been sending through. Uh, just whilst I'm reading through these questions and talking out, yeah, it would be great to actually have a little picture uh, to you to get a sense of, of what a submersible looks like while it's exploring underwater. And I'm just going to take the So, wonderful to have um, these questions. We've got um, a few here. Um, we have um, Emma in Acton um, looking at what are the main challenges involved in exploring the deep sea? Emma, amazing question. Thank you so much um, for sending that through. I mean, the main challenges that you have in exploring the deep ocean, of course, are is really pressure. Um, so when you're operating deep um, underwater, so the, the pressure changes by one whole atmosphere for every 10 meters you go down. So operating at 250 meters, that's 25 additional atmospheres of pressure. Um, of course, also, we as humans are not designed uh, to uh, breathe underwater. So, of course, we can sort of duck dive if we're sort of near the surface. We can use other technologies such as scuba gear. Um, so that's doing some normal sort of diving. And that's where you put um, air um, on your back and you have to take that air down with you. Now, to get even deeper than about 30 meters, and that's the sort of limit of recreational scuba, then you need to look at other technologies. And that's where submersible technology comes in, having a pressure hull to withstand the immense pressures that you get um, at those depths. And also um, to have that life support system so that human scientists can operate, work, and research down there. So those are the main challenges in exploring the deep sea. I mean, you do get some submersibles designed to go down all the way to 11,000 meters. And to sort of to, to describe the kind of pressure that those um, vehicles have, those submersibles have, is that it, it's imagine taking the Eiffel Tower, turning it upside down, and putting it on your big toe. Now, that is kind of pressure that you would feel at 11,000 meters, so immense pressures. The Necton first descent team not going down that far, uh, but still having to have incredibly specialized equipment to be able to explore the depths. Uh, and uh, this from Peter in Dagenham. Um, are there dangers to humans um, when exploring deep water under great pressure? Well, that's a really great follow-on question, Peter. And it's interesting because uh, we've just spoken about the immense pressure that you know, the vehicles have to withstand. And so if you're reliant on that technology, on, on that engineering, um, to be able to explore the depths, then of course there are dangers. Because if any of that goes wrong or were to have a problem, then you're completely reliant on that. And 
I think it's, you know, having spoken to Oliver, the chief executive of the next admission earlier today, he said, you know, we're not brave, we're we'll, we, we try to remain as calm as possible. I think it's immensely brave um, to put your trust um, in, in that equipment. And it's really interesting to compare the journeys that these scientists and pilots are doing to the journeys that astronauts make into space. And I think it's an interesting comparison when we do call submersible explorers aquanauts, because it is a hostile environment. It is an unknown environment. And those journeys that this team are making into the depths, we call it the next and first descent mission because nobody has ever been there before. They're attempting to make 50 first descents, 50 times into the depths where nobody has ever been and where we don't know what is there. So it's truly exploration and very, very exciting. So thank you very much, uh, Peter, for that question. Now, this from um, Daniela in Stevenage. Um, do scientists require physical training to explore the deep sea? Really, really uh, great question. So what we have is we have a number of different methods of exploring the deep, and I've described a few of those before. Now, if you were to do sort of deep diving, where you're working at 40 meters or so using scuba gear, then you do need to have that physical training because it puts immense pressure and exertion on the body. And some of those divers and coral experts, deep coral experts, whom we talk to during Coral Live in November each year, they will be using um, those specialist diving gear and they will be needing to do that specialist training. Now, when we have the scientists going down in, in the submersibles, because you have a pressure hull, because you're trying to keep the pressure inside the submersible the same as atmospheric pressure, it's very much being like if you're in an aeroplane and that differential in pressure that you're getting there. It's, it's you know cramped, it gets warm inside the submersible, but really you're not having that physical exertion of having that weight of water on top of you. The engineering is taking that pressure for you. So here we have, um, so Anthony from Leighton Buzzard, thank you so much for this question. Um, this is looking at what features of the submarine are specific to withstanding great pressure. It's a really great question. So the main thing that you can see, and I don't know whether we can get um, some footage of the submersible underwater up there. So you can probably see it looks like a very large um, transparent ping pong ball with a bit of engineering strapped to it. So the important thing is that pressure hull, that, that transparent ping pong ball. And that is made from clear acrylic, um, which is about that thick. And in terms of choosing uh, a, a material to withstand pressure, that's the most important piece. Um, various other pieces you, you, can, you can engineer. There's also what we have is, is where uh, the sort of weakest point potentially is where all the wiring goes from inside the submersible um, to outside. So that's a potentially um, weaker part. Um, so we've got here Marnie from High Wycombe looking at adaptations do animals have which enable them to live in the deep ocean. So I think that one of the most interesting adaptations that um, a range of deep ocean life has is uh, the use of light or self-generating light and we call that bioluminescence. And Imagine that sort of beneath sort of 300 meters, it's pretty well dark. And we can probably see how dark that kind of depth looks like at sort of 200 and 300 meters down with some footage that we've been sent through by the Necton team. And down further, further, further. So really at 1,000 meters, you're really getting no 
light coming from the surface at all. So that different species are using light in different ways. Some of them are using it um, defense, as defense. Some of them are using it to, to find a mate. Um, others to hunt. So you've got the anglerfish and the anglerfish so named because it has a sort of like almost a fishing rod coming from the top of its head with a sort of luminous lure uh, to attract um, prey and they swim towards it and they get munched uh, by the anglerfish. So I th for me, one of the most interesting adaptations of life in the dark, deep oceans is the use of light the self-generated light that we call bioluminescence. Scarlet giving us a rather scary question here. Uh, has a submersible ever cracked under pressure? That's a really interesting question. The, the, and I, thinking back to the first submersible uh, that went down to the bottom of the ocean in the Marianas Trench, um, the story goes um, that Walsh and Picard, the, the pilots of that uh, submersible, did experience a leak on the way down. And the amazing thing was that they reckoned that the increased pressure as they went deeper and deeper and deeper would squash that leak together. And so as they went deeper, um, the leak would stop. And they were right but the amazing courage and bravery to make that decision when you're in the middle of the ocean where no human had ever been before, I think that's incredible. Uh, certainly what you're looking at is the ability to test a lot of equipment um, and whether it can withstand that pressure. And you can create that pressure artificially. And we're in fact in one of those facilities in the UK that does just that with a range of different equipments and we'll be able to get some footage up of that later in the week of how different items of submarine equipment are put in a special container that's all locked shut and then you can increase the pressure to simulate to be like the different depths and the different pressures that you find underwater in the depths of the ocean. Now we've got the Triton submersibles that the Necton team are using and those are rated down to 300 meters, a thousand feet down. I think actually they can probably go a bit deeper and they've been tested to go deeper but that is not something that the pilots really want to push. So yes, cracks have appeared. Yes, there is a lot of work that gets done to make sure that when you have a piece of equipment that says it can go down to a certain depth, it really can. And it's amazing to be at one of the facilities in the UK that does just that. So we have a great question from Sarah in Mile End. Uh, why are you studying the ocean? Sarah and everybody else watching, I'm going to ask you one simple question is, do you like to breathe? Take one wonderful deep breath. Half of that oxygen that you've just breathed in comes from the ocean. The ocean is amazing. We live on a blue planet. Looking from space, you can really clearly see that 70% of the planet's surface is covered by ocean. If you took a globe in your school or classroom and you turned it so the center of the Pacific is facing you, you can hardly see any land at all. The ocean is the primary source of protein for a billion people through the fish it supplies. It regulates our climate and it makes up for a lot of the pollutants that we put up into the atmosphere and absorbs atmospheric carbon dioxide and heat and helps to keep our planet in balance. What we're doing at the moment is we're putting the ocean into a 
bit of trouble because we're putting more things into it than it might be able to handle. And we don't quite know how the different animals and other life will be able to cope with those changes. And so it is incredibly important to study the ocean and study new parts of the ocean to find out how it's changing and to underline the importance of taking positive action. Now, there's a lot about plastics in the news and there's a lot about climate change in the news. And those aren't just land problems, they're marine or ocean problems too. So talk about in your class the different things you can do to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases you emit as part of your daily life, examining how you travel, how you eat, and how you live. And also on that last point, just really reflecting on the amount of single-use plastic you might use in your everyday life. Is that takeaway coffee cup really necessary? Can I take a reusable water bottle to school? And so with those little things, we can appreciate the amazing awesomeness of the ocean, not just for what it does for us, but for its immense beauty as well. And then take those steps on our own, asking our friends, family, and perhaps politicians to make those changes on our behalf too. And I think we've got one last question. We've got a little bit of time for one last question, and that's from Kristen in Red Hill. Now, has the sub made any new discoveries recently? Well, I think they've had a, a friend with a very long tail, which we can just have a look at now. But it's really tricky to know for certain whether you've made any new discoveries during the expedition itself that will rely a lot on the research and analysis and DNA, genetic analysis done on the samples that are collected. On the last mission off the coast of Bermuda, over 100 new species were discovered. But this is this one example. This is a thresher shark. And you can see amazingly came up close to the submersible. And the wonderful thing about the thresher shark were these beautiful solitary creatures so you can see that long tail, that threshing tail, almost up to half its entire body length. So I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Thank you so much for joining this Submarine Engineer live investigation as part of Submarine Live. Do join us for the rest of this week as we bring the science and life of Necton First Ascent to classrooms around the world. Amazing to be part of the AXA XL Oceans Education Programme. And we'll also love to see you not just for this week, but for the 1st to the 8th of May, when we head to the frozen north in the Arctic to explore the ocean up there. But thank you so, so much for watching and look forward to having you as part of Encounter Live. It's bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.